Hi everyone, this is Doc Ina. Welcome to my lecture on fetal growth disorders. To download my lecture deck, please go to my WordPress site, Doc Ina Obigaine. Reference for this lecture is William Substetrix, Chapter 44, Fetal Growth Disorders. And this is the outline of my lecture. So human fetal growth is characterized by sequential patterns of tissue and organ growth, differentiation, and maturation. Fetal growth has been divided into three phases. The initial phase of hyperplasia occurs in the first 16 weeks, and this is characterized by a rapid increase in cell number. The second phase, which extends up to 32 weeks age of gestation, includes both cellular hyperplasia and hypertrophy. After 32 weeks, fetal growth is by cellular hypertrophy, and it is during this phase that most fetal fat and glycogen are accumulated. The corresponding fetal growth rates during these three phases are 5 grams per day at 15 weeks gestation, 15 to 20 grams per day at 24 weeks, and 30 to 35 grams per day at 34 weeks. This picture depicts the Colorado intrauterine growth charts, and this is the expected growth of the fetus intrauterine according to the age of gestation. So we have here the 10th percentile, the 50th percentile, the 90th percentile, and so on and so forth. So first, let's talk about fetal growth restriction. Fetal growth restriction entails low birth weight newborns that are small for gestational age or SGA. SGA neonates are those whose weights are below the 10th percentile for their gestational age. As you can see here in this table, I've already emphasized here the 10th percentile of weights. And below this would be uh, small for gestational age. Also on the right side, we have this picture or a graph that depicts the 10th percentile of the fetal gestational age weight according to gestational age. So for example, if we have a mother at the 34th week age of gestation, the 10th percentile of a fetal weight will be 1950. So if sonographically the fetus weighs less than this, then that fetus is considered to have fetal growth restriction. Growth-restricted fetuses are said to have increased risk for neonatal death. And there are two types of fetal growth restriction, the symmetrical type and the asymmetrical type. Symmetrical growth restriction implies a fetus whose entire body is proportionally small. On the other hand, asymmetrical growth restriction implies a fetus who is undernourished and is directing most of his energy to maintaining growth of the vital organs, specifically the brain and the heart, at the expense of the liver, muscle, and fat. And therefore, you have a normal head dimension but a small abdominal circumference, meaning you have a lagging abdominal growth compared to head growth. The resultant diminished glucose transfer and hepatic storage would primarily affect cell size and not the cell number. Thereby, fetal abdominal circumference, which reflects liver size, would be greatly reduced. This type of growth restriction is usually the result of placental insufficiency. This picture nicely depicts what asymmetric and symmetric growth restrictions are. So here in the leftmost side, we have the normal a proportion of a fetus. Symmetrical growth restriction means that there is small head and a small abdomen. So the growth restriction is proportional. In asymmetrical growth restriction, you have a normal head but a smaller abdomen. Brain sparing results from preferential shunting of oxygen and nutrients to the brain. And this usually happens in fetuses who are asymmetrically growth restricted. Brain sparing allows for normal brain and head growth. And because of brain sparing effects, asymmetrical fetuses are protected, quote unquote, from the full effects of growth restriction. These fetuses are said to be at greater risk for intrapartum and neonatal complications. Now, this is a table depicting the, a summary 
of the differences between asymmetric and asymmetric intrauterine growth restriction. For symmetric growth restriction, this happens usually early in utero, and the etiology would be congenital infections, genetic disorders, etc. Pathophysiology uh, is usually an impaired cell division, decreased cell number, which is irreversible. Clinical features include inadequate growth of the head and the body, and uh, the, the head-to-abdomen ratio is normal. And the prognosis here is poor. For asymmetric growth restriction, this happens at a later onset, and the etiology is usually a uteroplacental insufficiency, maternal malnutrition, and hypertension. And the pathophysiology is an impaired cellular hypertrophy, decreased cell size, and this is a reversible pathophysiology. Clinical features include uh, that the brain is spared, and so the head-to-abdomen ratio is increased. Prognosis is much more favorable than a symmetric growth restriction. So what are the causes of fetal growth restriction? The risk factors for impaired fetal growth include potential abnormalities in the mother, fetus, and placenta. These three compartments are depicted in these pictures. Some of these factors are known causes of IUGR and may affect more than one compartment. However, approximately 70% of fetuses with a birth weight below the 10th percentile for gestational age are constitutionally small. This means that the parents of the fetus are um, genetically small. So it follows that the fetus is also small. So in the remaining 30%, the cause of IUGR is pathologic. Definitive diagnosis frequently cannot be made until delivery. An early establishment of gestational age, a certain amount of maternal weight gain, and careful measurement of uterine fundal growth throughout pregnancy will identify many causes or cases of abnormal fetal growth in low-risk women. Some of the ways by which we diagnose fetal growth restriction include the following. Measuring the uterine fundic height. As we learned from the previous lectures, when we get a uterine fundic height that's way below the expected for the age of gestation, then we suspect a fetal growth restriction. Another way is by ultrasound and measuring the fetus or the fetal size by ultrasound, by amniotic fluid volume assessment also by ultrasound, and by doing a Doppler velocimetry. Early changes in placenta-based growth restriction are detected in peripheral vessels such as the umbilical and middle cerebral arteries. Late changes are characterized by abnormal flow in the ductus venosus and fetal aortic and pulmonary outflow tracts and by reversal of umbilical artery flow. Abnormal umbilical artery Doppler velocimetry findings characterized by absent or reverse end diastolic flow have been uniquely linked with fetal growth restriction. So how do we manage intrauterine growth restriction? If the fetus is less than 24 weeks, then we deliver if maternal status indicates. Otherwise, we can just uh, observe and repeat ultrasound every 3 to 4 weeks. For fetuses at 24 to 34 weeks, we evaluate maternal status and the comorbidities of the mother. We do umbilical artery Doppler velocimetry, fetal testing such as NSD or non-stress test, and by physical profile. So we also consider corticosteroids or giving corticosteroids for lung maturation. We consider delivery for these uh, patients when there is or there are reverse end diastolic flow, non-reassuring fetal tracing, and maternal or obstetrical indications that necessitate delivery. If there are no indications for immediate delivery, then we begin antepartum fetal surveillance such as regular fetal testing, weekly umbilical artery Doppler velocimetry, and weekly evaluation of the amniotic fluid. Repeat ultrasound for fetal growth is done every 3 to 4 weeks. Now, after monitoring for the fetal growth, if we see significant fetal growth, then we just continue antepartum fetal surveillance until 34 weeks. Then we begin the protocol for after 34 weeks as we will see uh, next in this slide. If there is no or poor fetal growth, then we consider delivery. So if the fetus is about 34 weeks and beyond, then we evaluate maternal status and comorbidities.
We also do umbilical artery, Doppler velocimetry, and fetal testing such as NST and BPP. We consider delivery if there's absent or reversed end diastolic flow on the Doppler velocimetry, oligohydramnios, non-reassuring fetal tracing, and maternal status or obstetrical indications that necessitate delivery. If there are no indications for immediate delivery, then we can do antepartum fetal surveillance, umbilical artery Doppler velocimetry weekly, and amniotic fluid evaluation weekly. Then we do repeat ultrasound for fetal growth monitoring every three to four weeks. If there is fetal growth, then we continue fetal surveillance until 38 weeks. Then we deliver. If there is none or poor fetal growth, then we consider immediate delivery. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists recommends that pregnancy is complicated by fetal growth restriction and at risk for birth before 34 weeks receive antenatal corticosteroids to facilitate pulmonary maturation. Antipartum fetal surveillance include periodic weekly Doppler velocimetry, sonographic assessment of fetal growth every 3 to 4 weeks, and fetal heart rate tracings. Next is fetal overgrowth. These are infants that exceed the 90th percentile for a given gestational week and are usually used as the threshold for macrosomia for large for gestational age birth weight. Usually, these are newborns who weigh 4,500 grams or more at birth. The risk factors for fetal overgrowth include the following. Obesity, diabetes, post-term gestation, multiparity, large size of parents, advancing maternal age, previous macrosomic infant, and racial and ethnic factors. Diagnosis will be the same as um, how we diagnose intrauterine growth restriction, which includes um, identification of risk factors in the mother, uterine fundic height measurement, and ultrasound by measuring fetal size and amniotic fluid also. So how do we manage fetal overgrowth? First is prophylactic labor induction. Some clinicians have proposed labor induction for when fetal macrosomia is suspected in non-diabetic women to obviate further fetal growth and thereby reduce potential delivery complications. This should theoretically reduce the risk of shoulder dystocia and cesarean delivery. However, current evidence does not support a policy for early labor induction before 39 weeks gestation or delivery for suspected macrosomia. Moreover, delivery or induction for suspected macrosomia at term is likewise not indicated. For elective cesarean delivery, the ACOG does not recommend routine cesarean delivery in women without diabetes when the estimated fetal weight is less than 5 kilos. In diabetic women, however, with overgrown fetuses, a cesarean section is an option. So in summary, we've talked about uh, fetal growth, fetal growth restriction, and fetal overgrowth and how to manage both conditions. That's it for my lecture. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to subscribe in my YouTube channel and my WordPress site, Dokino Thank you.